Hello, classroom. Hello, reading room. That's all right, classroom. So we are likely, I had to look for my book, but then I also spent just a little bit of time because I was early and then, then, I, then I'm late, of course, looking for a new book for us to read. So we'll see. But we're finishing up today. The sign of the v of the beaver. We're going to find out what happens to Matt's parents. <laughs> All stories are so sad. Oh, okay. But I'm looking at a couple things. I didn't realize that I had the adventures of Tom Sawyer. I did not know that I did. And so, of course, because this is an old version of it, uh, with a copyright of and it's illustrated as well mm. where's the copyright They have to have an original copyright date. Oh. It's in Roman numerals. If you don't know how to read that, we're going to talk about that on Thursday in Early Bird Classroom. It's in Roman numerals. 1,000. Uh, 50 from 1,000. No, 100 from 1,000. There we go. 100 from 1,000. So 1,954. 1954. I'm a little bit rusty on my Roman numerals, but there it is. There it is. Somewhere there. Yeah, there. So... To my wife, this book is affectionately dedicated. It's Thomas, or Thomas, it's Mark Twain's preface in his own words. And of course, like I said, all of the vernacular is going to be the original vernacular. So none of these words will have changed in order for people to not be so offended by the verbiage. I'm looking to see if they bounce out at me, right? That's what I'm doing. I'm looking to see if that word bounces out at me. And so far, I've probably been through about 10 pages, not in order, and it has not. Now I'm looking a little harder. through the conversations. <gasps> there it is for the first time. Tom Sawyer. So, I don't think I'm going to read this Tom Sawyer to you guys, uh, mainly because we had the Mostly True Adventures of Homer P. Fig, which I think is uh, is a nice version, a little bit of an updated version maybe for our ears, right? Or I will take, I think more, I might take a couple short stories. So these are, these are the books that I got from the Commerce Library, right, from their sale. They're used books, as you can see, but I love them. Um, and then this is from Doubleday, uh, Nelson Doubleday, uh, book publishing There's a name in here. Philobin. Anyway, this one, which I have several of, have short stories in here, right? So they're not, yeah. Here's 10 pages, but that first one's 36 pages. So, you know. And they're classics. 
I want to be an animal doctor. How Morse sent letters by lightning. Let's visit Canada. Blue bonnets for Lucinda. Flipper to the rescue. All of them had a story in here that I was familiar with, like I was familiar with Flipper to the rescue. Oh, I see. And then the copyright there is 1967. Huh. Look at that. And look at that. What I mean is look at that. Look at that in this book. So these, so were those pictures that they had in the original book, like in the center of the book? Maybe. Remember, they used to sometimes have photographs in the center of a book to get kids to buy it. Mm, worked. I like those. Never had any of my buy books when I was little. But it worked. It would work. have worked for me as a kid. I loved those. I remember. Let's get going. The sign of the V. The sign of the beaver. The V. Seriously. Chapter 21. Then one morning, a teen returned. Matt had been waiting, watching the forest trail impatiently, unwilling to go far from the cabin lest he miss the boys coming. But when, fam when, fin but when finally he saw a teen approaching, his heart sank. A teen was not alone. His grandfather stalked by his side. Matt sensed that this meant trouble. Perhaps Sackness had come to reproach him. He would surely know that the two boys had been neglecting those lessons. Dreading to face the old man, Matt walked out to meet him, courteously giving the greeting he had learned. Sackness returned his greeting with dignity. He did not smile. His solemn face made Matt's heart sink still lower. Then, startled, Matt turned toward a teen. He did not dare to ask a question, but he saw at once that there was no need to ask, no doubt about it. A teen had found his Manitou. He had changed. He stood straighter and taller. He looked older, and Matt suddenly realized why. The black hair, which had always hung straight down almost to his shoulders, was shaved away. His scalp, like his grandfather's, was bare, except for a single patch running back running back from his forehead and braided into a top knot fastened with a red string. Like the fresh bear grease that glistened on his skin, pride glistened all over him. Moreover, he carried a gleaming new rifle. You've got a gun, Matt, cried, politeness forgotten. My grandfather trained many bears, many beaver skin, a teen answered, though he had in these last days become a man, he had not yet learned altogether to hide his feelings. He did not say more. He waited now for his grandfather to speak. The old man's face was grave, but he did not ask about the lessons. Time of sun gets shorter, he said, like footsteps of birds, soon ice on water. I know it's October, Matt said, maybe November. He had not wanted to count his sticks the last weeks. Indian go north now, Sackness continued. Hunt moose, all Indians go. A teen not come more to learn white man's signs. Matt could not answer. Why father not come? Sackness went on. Matt spoke quickly. He ought to be here any day now. Sackness looked at him soberly. Maybe him not come, he said quietly. Anger flared up in Matt. He could not allow this man to speak the fear he had not never dared to admit to himself. Of course he'll come, he said too loudly. He might even come today. Snow comes soon, Sackness persisted. Not good white boy stay here alone. White boy come with Indians. Matt stared at him. Did he mean go on the hunt with them? The most important hunt of the year? Sackness smiled for the first time. Sackness teach white boy hunt moose like a teen. White boy and a teen be like brother. A sudden joyful hope sprang into Matt's mind. He realized at this moment just how anxious he had been. This was a way out. He did not have to stay here alone through the long winter. Then as swiftly as it had come, this new hope died away. In spite of his longing, in spite of being afraid, he knew what he had to answer. Thank you, he said. I'd like to go on the hunt, but I can't do that. If, 
when my father comes, he wouldn't know where I had gone. Leave white man's writing. Matt swallowed hard. Something might happen to the cabin. He's trusting me to take care of it. Maybe him not come, Sackness said again, not smiling now. He'll be here soon, Matt insisted. He was ashamed that his voice broke in the middle of the word. If he couldn't come, he'd, some, he'd send someone to tell me. He'd find some way no matter what happened. You don't know my pa. Sackness was silent for some time. White boy, good son, he said at last. But better you come, Sackness glad for white boy. Be McWenness. It's the best I got. Matt could only keep shaking his head. The man's word words had brought a great lump in his throat. Thank you, he managed. You've been very good to me, but I have to stay here. Without another word, Sactus held out his hand. Matt put his own into the bony grasp. Then the two Indians turned and went away. A teen had not even said goodbye. There would be no lesson that morning, no story, no tramping in the forest or fishing. Not this morning or any other morning. Close to panic, Matt wanted to run after them. He wanted to tell them that he had changed his mind, that he would go with them anywhere rather than stay here alone with winter coming on. But he set his jaw tight and stood where he was. After a few minutes, he reached for his axe and fell to splitting logs with a fury. He couldn't keep from thinking, however, was he just being foolish and stubborn? Wasn't going with them the wisest thing he could have done? Wouldn't his father have understood? He remembered hearing that many white men and white, white women too, who had been captured by the Indians and had lived many years in the wilderness, did not want to return to the white world when they had a chance, but had chosen instead to live with the Indians. He had never understood that, but now he could see very well how it might happen. He no longer distrusted them. He knew that a teen and his grandfather would be kind, and even the grandmother would make him welcome, and that would that they would share with him whatever they had, no matter how little. He had found friendship and goodwill in their cabin. He had envied a teen, his free, unhampered life in the forest, and the boisterous camaraderie comradeship in the village. If he had been taken captive as a child and raised as an Indian boy, how would he himself have chosen? It wouldn't be the same to make that choice deliberately. He was poured that day. He was proud that they had wanted him to live with them, but he knew he could never be really proud as a teen was proud of being a hunter. He belonged to his own people. He was bound to his own family as a teen was bound to his grandfather. The thought that he might never see his mother again was sharper than hunger or loneliness. This was the land his father had cleared to make a home for them. It was his land too. He could not run away. He was troubled that a teen had walked away without a word of farewell. Had he been offended? Had he really wanted Matt to go with them? To be a brother? Or was he only obeying his grandfather as he had had to do about the lessons? It was so hard to tell what a teen was thinking. A teen had become a hunter. He had a gun. He would not have time now to wander through the forest or to listen to stories. He would not have a he would not have to bother any longer with a white boy who would never really be a mighty hunter, but surely a teen could have held out his hand as his grandfather had done. Chapter 22. Every morning, in spite of himself, Matt kept an eye out for a teen. When four days had gone by, he decided there was little chance that he would see his friend again. Doubtless, the Indians had already left the village and were on their way north. So when he saw a teen coming through the woods with his dog at his heels, he ran across the, across the clearing to meet him, not bothering to hide his relief and pleasure. You think different? A teen asked quickly. You go with us? Matt's eagerness died away. No, he said unhappily. Please try to understand a teen. I must wait for my father. A teen nodded. I understand, he said. My grandfather understand too. I do same for my father if he still live. 
The two boys stood looking at each other. There was no amusement and no scorn in the teen's eyes. How very strange, Matt thought. After all the brave deeds he had dreamed of to win this boy's respect, he had gained it at last just by doing nothing, just by staying here and refusing to leave. My grandfather sent you gift, a teen said now. He unstrapped from his back he unstrapped from his back a pair of snowshoes. They were new, the wooden smooth, the wood smooth and polished, the netting of deer hide woven in neat design. Before Matt could find words, a teen went on. My grandmother sent send gift, he said. He took from his pouch a small birch basket of maple sugar. Late in the season like this, Matt knew sugar was scarce and dear to the Indians. Thank you, he said. Tell your grandmother that when you come back, I'll help gather more sap for her. A teen was silent. Now come back, he said then. In spring, I mean, when the hunt is over. Not come back, a teen repeated. Not live in village again. Our people find new hunting ground. But this is your home. My people hunters. My grandfather say many white men come soon. Cut down trees, make house, plant corn. Where my people hunt? What could man answer to this? He had only one argument to offer. Your grandfather wants you to learn to read, he reminded a teen. I haven't been much of a teacher, but when my family comes, it will be different. My mother will teach you to read and to write, too. What for I read? My grandfather, mighty hunter. My father, mighty hunter. They not read. Your grandfather wants you to be able to understand treaties, Matt insisted. We go far away. No more white man, not need to sign paper. An uncomfortable doubt had long been troubling Matt. Now before a teen went away, he had to know. This land, he said slowly, this place where my father built his cabin. Did it belong to your grandfather? Did he own it once? How one man owned ground, a teen questioned. Well, my father owns it now. He bought it. I not understand, a teen scowled. How can man own land? Land same as air. Air for all people to live on. For beaver and deer. Does deer own land? How could you explain, Matt wondered, to someone who did not want to understand? Somewhere in the back of his mind, there was a hidden suspicion that a teen was making sense, and he was not. It was better not to talk about it. Instead, he asked, where will you go? My grandfather say much forest where sun go down. White man not come so far. To the west, Matt had heard his father talk about the west. There was good land there for the taking. Some of his neighbors in Quincy had chosen to go west instead of buying land in Maine. How could he tell a teen that there would be white men there too? Still, they said there was no end of land in the West. He reckoned there must be enough for both white men and Indians. Before he could think of what to say, a teen spoke again. I give you gift, he said. Dog like you, I tell him stay with you. You mean you're not taking him with you? No good for hunt, a teen said. Walk slow now. Good for stay here with Metabi, with white brother. A teen's careless words did not deceive Matt. He knew very well how a teen felt about that no-good dog that followed him everywhere he went. And a teen had said, white brother. Matt could not find the words he needed. <laughs> but he knew there was something he must do. He had to have a gift for a teen, and he had nothing to give. Nothing at all that belonged to him. Robinson Crusoe? What could that mean to a boy who would never know how to read it. He did have one thing. At the thought of it, something twisted tight in his stomach, but it was the only thing he had that could possibly match the gifts a teen had given him. Wait here, he told a teen. He went into the cabin and took down the tin box. The watch was ticking away inside it. He had never forgotten to wind it, even when he was too tired to notch a stick. Now he lifted it out and held it in his hand, the way he had held it when his father had given it to him as though it were a fragile bird's egg. His father would never understand. Before he could think about it, another minute Matt hurried back to where a teen stood waiting. I have a gift for you, he said. It tells the time of the day. I'll show you how to wind it up. 
Mateen held the watch even more carefully. There was no mistaking that he was pleased and impressed. Probably, Matt thought, a teen would never learn to use it. The sun and the shadows of the trees told him all he needed to know about the time of the day, but a teen knew that Matt's gift was important. Fine gift, he said. He put the watch very gently into his pocket. Then he held out his hand. Awkwardly, the two boys shook hands. Your father comes soon, a teen said. I hope you get the biggest moose in Maine, Matt answered. A teen turned and walked into the woods. The dog sprang up to follow him. A teen motioned him back and uttered one stern order. Puzzled, the dog sank down and put his chin between his paws. As a teen walked away, he whined softly, but he obeyed. Matt knelt down and put his hand on the dog's head. Oh, endings of stories are so hard, aren't they? Chapter 23. Matt filled his days with work. He made the cabin trim where the clay had dried and crumbled away between the logs. He brought new mud, strengthened it with pebbles, and packed with spaces tightly. And packed the spaces tightly. On the inside, he chinked every tiny crack to make the room snug. The pile of logs stacked up against the cabin wall grew steadily higher. His meager harvest was safely stored away. The corn, the little he had managed to save from the deer and crows, had all been shucked. Sitting by the fire after his supper, he scraped the dried kernels from the cobs, remembering the many long evenings at home when he and his sister Sarah had been set to the same work with a corn scraper. Sarah would laugh now to see him rubbing away with an old clamshell like an Indian. Some of the ears of corn he had hung against the wall by the twisted hus husks and he, as he had seen his mother do. She had said once they were like scraps of sunshine in the dark days. Overhead, he hung strips of pumpkin on ropes of vine strung from wall to wall. They would be ready for his mother to make into pies. In a corner leaned the old flour sack overflowing with the nuts he had gathered, hickory and butternut, and even the acorns he had once thought proper food only for squirrels. On the shelf ranged birch baskets filled with dried berries and the wild cranberries he had discovered shining like jewels along the boggy shores of the pond. They were puckery to the tongue, but when his mother came, she would bring sugar and the stewed cranberries would make a fine treat with her bread of white flour. Matt forced himself to eat sparingly of these things, the corn he regarded as a sort of trust. His father had planted it and would be counting on it to feed the family through the winter, and some must be saved for the spring planting. Proud though he was of his harvest, Matt knew in his heart it was far from enough. The hunt for food would be never ending. Hour after hour, his bow, Matt with his bow, Matt tramped through the, the forest, the dog beside him. There was not much game to hunt these days. More often than not, his snares were empty. Soon the animals would be buried deep in, in burrows. Twice he had glimpsed a caribou moving through the trees, but he had little hope of bringing down any large animal with his light arrows. Once in a long while, he succeeded in shooting a duck or a muskrat. The squirrels were too quick for him. Although the dog was certainly not much of a hunter, he did occasionally track down some small creature. But he also had to eat his share, sometimes more than his share, because Matt could not resist those beseeching eyes. True to tell, they were both hungry much of the time. Luckily, they would not starve with the pond and creeks teeming with fish. Matt knew that for many months of the year, fish filled the Indian cook pots. Luckily, too, fish were easy to catch, though Matt had to be continually twisting and splicing new lines from vines and spruce roots. Mornings now, he had to shatter a skim of ice on the pond. Soon he would have to cut holes with his axe and let his lines down deep. He shivered to think of it. It was the cold that bothered him most. His homespun jacket was still sound since he had little use for it in the warm weather, but his breeches were threadbare. One knee showed naked through a gaping hole and the frayed legs stopped a good five inches from his ankles. 
His linen shirt was thin as a page of his father's Bible and so small for him that it threatened to split every time he moved. Even inside the cabin, he was scarcely warm enough. The moment he ventured outside, his teeth chattered. He thought enviously of the Indian's deerskin leggings, but a deer was far beyond his prowess as a hunter. There were two blankets on his pine bed, his father's and his own. Why couldn't one of them cover him in the daytime as well as in the night? He spread a blanket out on the floor and hacked it with his axe and his knife, using his worn-out breeches as a pattern. From the leftover scraps, he carefully pulled threads and twisted them together. He had seen the Indian woman using bone needles, and he searched about outside the cabin till he found some thin, hard bits of bone. These he had shaved down with his knife. He ruined three bits trying to poke a hole through the bone before he thought to finally try a thin slit instead of to hold the thread. Finally, he managed to sew his wooden pieces together. He thrust his legs into the shapeless breeches and gathered the top about his waist with a bit of rope. He was mighty pleased with himself. He was going to be forever hauling them up and they were sure to trip him up if he had to run, but at least he could kneel on ice and pull in the, his lines. From two rabbit skins, he made some mittens without thumbs. He had no stockings, and his moose hide moccasins were wearing thin. He decided he could stuff them with scraps of blanket or even with duck feathers. He remembered that once in a downpour, a teen had shown him how to line his moccasins with dried moss to soak up the rain. Perhaps moss could soak up the cold as well, and there was plenty of it about. His most satisfying achievement was his fur hat. For this he knew he must have more fur. In the woods, a teen had once pointed out to him a deadfall constructed of heavy logs so intricately balanced that they would fall with deadly accuracy on an animal that attempted to steal the bait inside. Beaver and otter were caught in such traps, a teen explained, sometimes even bear. Now Matt determined to make one for himself, perhaps a small one. It would take a very large log even it would take a very large log even to stun a strong animal, and he had no wish to come upon a wounded bear. Much as he would like a bear skin, he would try for a smaller animal. He felled and trimmed two good-sized trees. Setting the logs on lighter post was a feat of delicate balance that took him hours of patient trial and error. Over and over, they crashed down, threatening his toes and fingers. Finally, they held to his satisfaction, and gingerly, he slipped three fish inside the trap. To his astonishment, on the third morning, he found an animal lying under the fallen log so nearly dead that it was no task to club it. It was smaller than the otters had, he had seen playing along the banks. A fisher, perhaps? That night, he and the dog feasted on crackling bits of roast meat. It was strong flavored and he knew the Indians did not care to eat it, but he could not be so choosy. Other strips he hung over the fire to smoke. There had also there was also a scant amount of yellow fat. Used sparingly, a spoonful of that fat would make his usual fish diet taste like a banquet. The real treasure was the pelt heavy and lustrous. He worked on it slowly as he watched the Indian women work. With a sharp-edged stone, he scraped away every trace of fat and flesh from the skin. He washed it in the creek and for days, in his spare hours, rubbed and stretched it to make it soft and pliable. He then set to work with his bone needle. He was enormously proud of the cap he'd fashioned. Sackness himself would have envied it. Most of his work had to be done by firelight. He longed for candles. He ate his supper by the light of split pine branches set in a crackling set in a crack in the chimney. He gave light a plenty. They gave light a plenty, but they smoked and dripped sticky pitch and was always afraid he might drop off to sleep and wake up to find the log chimney afire. At any rate, after a day of chopping and tramping, he was tired enough to go to bed with the dark. So often he did the squaw work that a teen would have despised. Thoughts of his mother filled his head. 
He imagined her moving about the cabin, humming her little tunes as she beat up a batch of cornbread, shaking out the broadcloth at the door, for, of course, she would not let them eat at a bare table. She could see her sitting by the fire he could see her sitting by the firelight in the evening, her knitting needles clicking as she made a wooden sock for him. A woolen sock. <laughs> there are wooden shoes. So shut up. <laughs> Sometimes he could almost hear the voice he could almost hear the sound of her voice and when he shut his eyes he could see her special smile. He tried to think of ways to please her. She would need new dishes for the good meals she would cook. He whittled out four wooden trenches and four clean new bowls, rubbing them smooth with sand from the creek. He made a little brush to clean them with from a birch sapling, carefully splitting the ends into thin fibers in the same way he made a sturdy birch broom to sweep the floor. Then he set himself a more difficult task, a cradle for the baby. With only an ax and his knife, the work took all his patience. His first attempts were fit only for kindling, but when the cradle was done, he was proud of it. It was clumsy, perhaps, but it rocked without bumping, and there wasn't a splinter anywhere to harm a baby's skin. Sitting by the fire, it seemed a promise that soon his family would be there. When he had a few more rabbit skins, he would make a song. When he came home from school, pigtails flying, eyes shining, demanding to know everything that had happened there, Sarah hated fiercely being a girl and having no school to go to. She would be full of curiosity in the forest. She wasn't afraid like most girls. She was spunky enough to try almost anything. She was like that Indian girl, a teen sister. What a pity they couldn't have known each other. I thought so too. Chapter 24. Matt stood looking up at the sky over the clearing. It's going to snow, he told the dog. You can feel it, can't you? The dog lifted its nose, testing the promise in the air. Matt reckoned he had been lucky so far. The heavy snows had not come. There had been flurries, thin and swirling, sifting through the trees. Many mornings, many mornings he had walked to find a coating of white on the cabin roof, which would melt away under the noonday sun. Today, everything seemed different. The sky was the color of his mother's pewter plate. The brown, withered leaves of the oak trees hung motionless from the branches. Three cows searched noisily among the dry corn stalks. A flock of small birds hopped nervously under the pines. It's almost Christmas, he said out loud. He could not remember for sure how many weeks belonged to each month. Sometimes he was not even certain that he had remembered to cut a notch every day. Each day was so like the day before, and Christmas Day, when it came, would not have anything to mark it from all the others. He tried to put out of his mind the thought of his mother's Christmas pudding. We'd better get an extra we better get in extra firewood, he said, and the dog scrambled eagerly after him. Late in the day the snow began soundlessly, steadily. Before dark it had laid a white blanket over the trees and the stumps and the cabin. When Matt and the dog went outside at bedtime, the chilly whiteness reached over his moccasins and closed around his bare ankles. They were both thankful to hurry inside again. Next morning, in the darkness of the cabin, Matt made his way to the door. He could scarcely push it open. The bank of snow outside reached almost to the latch. He stared at it in alarm. Was he going to be a prisoner in his own cabin? With all his preparations, he had never thought of a shovel. His axe would be about as much as a use as a teaspoon. He set himself to hewing a slab of firewood to make some sort of blade. By the time he had dug a few feet away of pathway, the sun was high. He, set, he stepped into the dazzling white world. Now at last, he could make use of the snowshoes that hung on the cabin wall. Eagerly, he strapped the bindings about his legs and climbed up out of the narrow path he had dug. The snowshoes held him tight, lightly. He stood poised on the snow like a duck on water. But with his first steps, he discovered that he could not even waddle like a duck on land. The clumsy hoops got in each other's way, one of them forever getting trapped beneath the other. All at once, he got the knack of it, and he wanted to shout out loud. 
He tramped from one of his snares to another, waiting every few moments for the dog who floundered happily behind him. The snares were buried deep and empty, and he set them higher just in case some animal might venture out of its burrow. Then he tramped all the way to the pond for the sheer pleasure of it. Coming back through the woods, he marveled at his own tracks like the claw prints of a giant bird. Suddenly he realized that he was happy as he had never been in the weeks since a teen had gone away. He was no longer afraid of the winter ahead. The snowshoes had, snow had set him free. The cabin was warm and welcoming. He melted snow in his kettle and made a tea of tips of hemlock. He shredded and crushed a handful of acorns and boiled them with a strip of pumpkin. Afterwards, for the first time in weeks, he took down Robinson Crusoe, Reading by the firelight, he felt drowsy and contented. Life on a warm island in the Pacific might be easier, but tonight Matt thought that he wouldn't for a moment have given up his snug cabin buried in the snow. Last chapter 25. Three days later, snow threatened again, and Matt gathered a pile of firewood to dry inside. He had just carried in a third armful when he heard the dog barking frantically a short distance away. Matt found him standing on the bank of the creek. His feet braced the ridge of hair standing up along his back. Peering along the creek, Matt caught his breath. Something dark was moving along the frozen course of the stream, a huge shape too large to be an animal, even a moose. Then he saw it, a man, dragging behind him some sort of sled. He didn't move like an Indian. As he watched, Matt made out a second smaller shape, just coming into sight around the bend of the creek. He did not shout. He did not dare to shout for fear they would vanish like ghosts. He stood still, his heart pounding. Then finally he began to run. Paw. He choked. Pa. Like I'm choking. His father flung down the pack he carried. His arms went around Matt and held fast, though he could not manage to speak a word. Then Matt saw his mother struggling to climb down from the sled. He bent and threw his arms around her. How small she seemed, even under the heavy cloak. Sarah came floundering through the snow in her father's footsteps and stood staring at him, her eyes bright under the woolen hood. She wasn't the child he remembered. Awkwardly, he put his arms around her and gave her a hug. Then they were all talking at once, trying to be heard over the fierce clamor of the dog. Quiet, Matt shouted at him. This is my family. They've come. They've ac they're actually here. They pushed their way through the snow to the cabin, leaving the sled where it stood in the middle of the ice. Matt helped his mother over the doorstep. He could see she was scarcely able to stand, and he pulled a stool nearer the fire for her. She clung to him, her eyes on his face. Matt would hardly have recognized her so thin and pale, with great shadows under her eyes. But those eyes were warm and shining, and her smile was as beautiful as he had remembered. I was bound... We'd get here for Christmas, she panted. I couldn't have borne it to let Christmas go by. Oh, Matt, you're safe. It was the typhus, his father explained. We all took sick with it, and the fever was bad. Takes all the strength out of a body. Your ma got took the worst. We'd ought to be, we ought to have waited longer till she was more fit, but she was dead set on starting. The river is most frozen shut. We had to wait at the trading post three weeks before anyone would risk carrying us. Then we had to get the sled made. But your ma, she kept pushing at us. She's a rare one. She's a rare one, your ma. I had to, she said, thinking of you alone in this place. It wasn't so bad, Matt said stoutly. I wasn't alone all the time. I had the Indians. Indians, his mother gasped. Are there Indians hereabouts? Pa said there wouldn't be, Sarah exclaimed, wide-eyed. What are they like? They're gone now, Matt said, but they were my friends. Then he brought it out proudly. I had an Indian brother. 
From the way they stared at him, he could see it was going to take a mighty lot of explaining before they could understand. He didn't suppose they ever would truly. His father said nothing. He was looking soberly at the snowshoes propped against the wall and at the bow hanging over the door where the rifle should have been. Everywhere he looked, Matt realized he must see something the Indians had given him or had taught him how to make for himself. However, his father seemed to think there was no time now for questions. We'd better get unpacked. We'd better unpack the sled, he said, before it starts to snow again. Matt sprang to help. There was one question he had not dared to ask till he and his father were alone. The baby, did you leave it behind? His father ran a hand over his beard. His eyes were troubled. The little one only lived for five days, he answered. "'Twas a pitiful little thing, would never have made this journey. Just don't say aught to your ma. She still takes it hard. Matt promised. He wished he had somehow been able to hide the cradle before she noticed it. Standing in the snow, his father reached to put a hand on Matt's shoulder. "'You've done a grown man's job, son,' he said." I am proud of you. Matt could not speak. See how I act out the story? I'm a storyteller. Matt could not speak. It took his breath away to think that he might have gone with the Indians, that they might have come to an empty cabin and found that all his mother's fears had come true. He would never have heard the words his father had just spoken. This was how a teen had felt. He knew when he had found his Manitou and become a hunter. As his father untied the bundles from the sledge, Matt lugged them into the cabin. Flour, molasses, a fine new kettle, warm bright quilts, and thanks be new books for him, and a woolen jacket and breeches. He felt richer than Robinson Crusoe with all his plunder from that sunken ship. Then he noted that his father had a new rifle, and presently he discovered, poking out from his mother's pack, his own old musket. His own old musket. He had a doubt she had learned to use it and would have too had her family been threatened. He suspected that even Sarah, so grown up now, wouldn't have feared to pull that trigger if there'd been a need of it. Well, there'd been no more need of it now with two men to fend for themselves. Inside the cabin, Sarah was bustling capably about, unwrapping the pewter dishes, setting out the little whale oil lamp that had always stood on the table in Quincy. That's the funniest looking dog I ever saw, she said. It won't come near us. He's an Indian dog, Matt told her. He's suspicious of white folks. You wait. You'll get to like him. He couldn't get over how much older she looked, but still spunky. Her eyes were sparkling, and Matt suspected that for her, the long journey had just been an adventure. He should have made her a bow instead of a doll, and he would too the first chance he got. His mother had thrown off her cloak, and the fire had brought a bit of color to her cheeks. She was making a great show of coming home. If the cabin seemed rough and cramped after the pretty house she had left behind, she never let on for a moment. She went about admiring everything, the drying ears of corn, the strings of pumpkin, the fine new wooden bowls he had carved, all this food she marveled, and Ivan feared you were starving. He was thankful now for the times he had gone hungry to save what he could for their coming. There's jerky for supper, he told her. I tried not to eat too much of it. You can make a pretty fair stew with that and a little pumpkin. Some salt would help, would sure help if you brought any. As he started out again, his mother stopped him and put her hands on his shoulders. Wait a minute, she said. I just want to look at you. She had to tip her head back. She had to tip her head back to do it. See, this is what moms do. You look different, Matt. You're most as tall as your pa, and awful thin. You're so brown, I'd taken you for an Indian. I almost was one, he said, giving her a quick hug to show he was joking. He hoped she'd never know how true it was. We're going to have neighbors, she said happily as she set the new kettle over the fire. A man and his wife have a claim not five miles from here. 
They're staying at, at the trading post till spring. We plan to share a pair of oxen. They say three other families are coming too. They're going to set up a mill. For you know what? We'll have a town here. Maybe even a school for you children. Neighbors, that was the thought that would take some getting used to. Matt supposed he ought to be pleased. Yes, of course he was pleased. It was just that he rather liked it as it was here in the forest. With all the gladness in him right now, you would have you would think there'd be You wouldn't think there'd be room for any other thought. But even now, with his family here, their voices filling the long silence, with their worries vanishing like smoke up the chimney, he suddenly thought of the Indians. He wished that Atina and his grandfather could know that they had been right to stay, that his father had come as he had promised them. But the old man had been right too. More white men were coming. There would be a town here on the land where the Indians had hunted the caribou and the beaver. If only he could be sure that the Indians had found a new hunting ground. Matt thrust his arms into his new jacket and went out again into the snow. Behind the cabin glowed warm and filled with life. Already steam was rising from the new kettle. He'd cooked one of his special stews for them for supper, and he wouldn't have to eat it alone. They would all sit together around the table and bow their heads while his father asked the blessing. Then he would tell them about a teen. Ah! Oh! Ah! Oh! That's it. The end. Oh, what a good story. I'm so happy the family came back, as you can tell. Okay, that's it for the reading room. We will start a new book tomorrow. I don't know what I'm going to decide to start with. Thanks for joining me in the reading room. This is Dr. Annette Farovich. I'm the teacher. You have been in the classroom.